Fine. Um, you might be able to tell by the last name. ESOPs are obviously pretty near and dear to my heart. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm curious in what ways do you see from a cultural perspective um, sort of the certified B Corp overlap with ESOPs and which ways do you sort of see them as distinctly different? And obviously I, I see Revision Energy and I know they're both. So um, maybe they can join, join in as well. But I'm just curious where you see that sort of distinction and where you see that overlap. Oh, it's interesting. And for, you know, for folks on the phone that don't know, ESOP employee stock owned plan, which essentially is when a, typically in a sale of a company, the owners, the owners will transfer ownership over the employees and the employees kind of run the company. Um, you know, it's interesting. So we're, you know, obviously as a mutual bank, we don't have shareholders. So our stockholders kind of do that. So I think the ESOP is probably the ultimate manifestation of employee empowerment and employee stakeholder. And there's probably no doubt about that. I, but I'd leave it to fill a revision to talk about that more specifically, you know, uh, uh, having been an ESOP and a B Corp. But I, I think that, you know, it's one thing to say that, you know, ESOP vests ownership into the employees and makes them a stakeholder. You could have that and you could still have an organization that is strictly um, focused on profit, right? Without that. So I think they, they're, they're different approaches. One is a structure that makes you a stakeholder but it's also, are you recognizing other stakeholders? Are you recognizing environmental sustainability and other pieces? So they can layer on, as revision is done, they can layer very effectively. And Fortunat, if you wouldn't mind sharing any of your insight into that, because you'd have plenty, you're, you're welcome to do that. And then um, Erica has noted in the chat that this chapter will be having a panel on ESOPs on June 4th. <laughs> so you can go to the website and sign up for that too, but Fortunat, definitely add in whatever you'd like. Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo what Neil said. Um, I think they are two strongly complementary things. You know, as you say, um, employee ownership sort of collapses two of your primary stakeholders in, in your you know, shareholders and your employees. Um, and that is, uh, you know, that makes, in some ways that makes the sort of rest of the B Corp stuff easier because, um, you know, two of your, you know, five or six primary stakeholders are now sort of definitionally aligned. Um, but it is, um, you know, I would say there's there's lots of employee-owned companies who are still bastards, and, um, <laughs> and there's lots of B corps that are still closely held, um, and so they're not they're not um, they're not entirely overlapping. Um, there there is for those who are interested in that there is there's been some pretty interesting efforts around this uh, by an organization called Fifty by Fifty and the Democracy Collaborative down in I think a out of the Stern School at NYU um, around the power of employee ownership and um, you know mission-driven business in combination together. We did a pretty good report a couple of years ago. Happy to share if anyone's interested. Thanks, Fortuna. That's awesome. And Jeffrey asked a question about playbooks in the chat. And uh, Wendy, thank you to giving a link um, to a playbook from B Lab. So that's awesome. B Lab is kind of the mother company of the B Corp certification process and there is tons of information on their website as well about the certification process. It's also where you can find the business impact assessment or what's called the BIA that Neil mentioned earlier that you can do for free um, to, to sort of check out how the process works and see where you might stand in your organization. Again, using the model of I, I take the oath and I can prove it <laughs> as Neil described before. Uh, Jeffrey, did you have a question that you wanted to ask? Sorry, I was just taking the oath. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. All righty, that's spreading. But thanks for that. The resources is really what I was looking for. Okay. I, I appreciate it. Great. And also, Neil, thank you for your time. It's really been helpful um, to hear your journey with this. My, my pleasure. And Tara, thank you. Oh, yeah, of course. My absolute pleasure. What other questions do people have? I'm just going to check the chat quickly. Um, any other questions for Neil about his journey or what's next or any other general questions for the group, because we have lots of experts here that can probably answer questions. This is Becky, I have a question. Um, thank you, Neil, so much. This was really inspiring. Um, we are in the process, we've submitted our B Corp um, assessment and we're in the queue for an auditor. Um, and one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is how we regularly communicate all of the metrics to the team. And I was curious if you've already have some rhythms of how you talk with your team or your board about all of the um, KPIs for B Corp? Uh, so great questions and I would say candidly, no. 
So a little bit of the dog that caught the car. And, you know, that is part of the next phase for us is, you know, there's the annual B Corp. You know, we're looking at kind of integrating probably our annual reporting requirement with our, our formal annual report uh, as a bank. And we'll be looking at our KPIs. But that'll, candidly, that's hopefully be part of the work of the, the B team and the employee teams within their areas to look at not only the B Corp assessment, I will suggest that we will go broader. So we will certainly look at the, the B Lab questions of KPIs and areas, but we'll probably look at measurements from some of these other organizational organizations. Well, there's a sustainable accounting standards board that has a special set of metrics reporting measures for um, financial institutions. And there's a number of other um, reporting metrics out there that we may just kind of also incorporate into that, but that'll probably be part of the next phase for us. But I think, you know, I would kind of applaud your efforts to think about that transparency and how you get that cadence of you know accountability and sharing and recognize too i think this is not going to be a linear process i think in all humility realize we will you know maybe take two steps forward one step back and although you know this is highly aspirational we're an institution full of human beings so i think the other thing is we, we will stumble in some regards we will not do things perfectly and try to be transparent about that and hopefully you know you're in the trust your stakeholders that they recognize that and they stay with you as, on this journey. But best of luck in your in the validation process. Thank you. Great question. Thank you, Becky. Any other uh, questions? I was just going to make a quick point. And, and Neil, thank you. That was an outstanding presentation. I was just going to throw out the fact that uh, UNH's B Impact Clinic is a great way for companies to kind of test the waters. And I know, I think, Neil, you might have gone through that. I, I, uh, Becky, if I'm correct, you may be going through that as well. So, no, I know there are a few companies that have gone through that clinic and have ultimately gone on to certification. And on a twice a year basis, uh, Fiona Wilson at UNH and a group of her students are helping companies go through that the 200 questions about B Impact certification or B, B Lab certification. So, so, so Todd, that, that's actually a great reference. We were not able to go through it because we couldn't get the timing to line up for us, but we did explore it. We were very impressed with them. And I, and I have spoken to other companies that have gone through it uh, as well, in other companies in Maine. So that's a great reference because they have a tremendous amount of resources and you're, you're working with these students, which I, I've, I've heard is really compelling. Yeah. Yeah, I have a client that's actually, I'm glad you mentioned that too, Todd. I have a client that's going through that now with um, that, that group and has their own set of students. And they recently compared the students and the motivation and drive of the students to consultants and other um, really highly esteemed professionals and said the students were, were doing better. <laughs> so I think that's a good, good tribute to that program and the amount of resources and headway that you can make in really understanding where you're at on the BIA after you've done your own assessment to, to really help figure out um, what your situation and get all your decks in a row, so to speak, to, to potentially apply, um, I think is a, another really important piece because internal resources are sometimes the second challenge to the board part that we already talked about, Neil, <laughs> just like, right, right. as you said, people were doing this in addition to their regular jobs at Androscoggin Bank. Um, and I think that's generally the case for most organizations that are going after it. So that's another element to consider. Absolutely. Glad you mentioned that, Todd. What other questions do we have in our last few minutes? Um, hi, Neil, I just wanted to ask, I remember you saying like five years ago when you started talking about this, it was based on kind of nothing being certain in banking and that you wanted to focus on the people. So I'm curious five years later after COVID, like is there a more certainty about like where banking is going and how does that influence maybe the strategy changing for, for the B core side of things going forward? I think the only say wherever it's going, it's going there faster. So I will say that. And, and I think there's still less certainty. I think that we have all these dynamics happening within the industry we have technology, we have these fintechs and now the big techs uh, coming into the space. So there's a lot of change. I think for us, you know, we're not being benchmarked against the bank down the street. We're getting benchmarked for the technology experience for Apple and Amazon, so in one sense. But through it all, I think we saw through PPP, folks came and realized that um, relationships matter even more, especially the local community. 
I think folks, you know, it, it came through to us and the, and the response we got from our clients. So we feel really confident. Again, I wouldn't say there's a tremendous amount more clarity of what's going to happen in the industry. There's still a lot of consolidation and change, but I think we would say we are much more confident that we're on the right path, that if you focus on relationships, you know, within your community, you know, building that culture and then reflecting outside those deep relationships, no matter what happens, we'll be okay. One, because we think clients will value those relationships, especially our business clients value those relationships more than trying to do online uh, banking with, you know, some at the national level who may not answer the phone in a crisis, for example. Um, and I think also within our, you know, if we have a, a, a great culture and really talented high performing employees, they will be the source of the solutions to enable us to pivot, to continue to be relevant to our clients going forward. That's really the, the secret source. It's the capability. This world's just going to uh, continue to change. That pace of change is going to accelerate. It's really the resiliency and the innovation, the capabilities of your, your human capital that become your competitive advantage going forward. So, you know, we're fully confident that we're going down the right path. It's a great question, though. And if you find out, let me know. <laughs> So any last burning questions before we wrap up today? It's been such an amazing conversation, Neil, and we had great participation from the group. Do we have one more or is everyone feeling full for this afternoon? Okay, well, it looks like everybody's full, Neil, because you've given us so much to think about and really appreciate the time and how articulate you were and thoughtful you were in answering the questions uh, from everybody. And I see lots of smiling faces and interesting people. I really appreciate that many of you have stayed on video because that's really nice that it makes it a, a little bit of a community, particularly for Neil, as he can like look at people <laughs> rather than just me. So um, thank you for doing that too. And then also recognize some people can't do that, but they've still been here and, and certainly their presence has been felt. So we really appreciate everybody's time this afternoon. We know that there's lots of competing priorities, so, but, uh, particularly in Zoom world where um, you have to constantly make decisions about where you're going to where your next screen is gonna be. Um, and so please continue to follow us and check out the website as Darren put in the chat and sign up for our future events if you're interested and you can reach out to me or Darren at any point for more information. And we'll put also our emails directly in the chat as well. So thank you very much and everybody have a great afternoon.